a glitch there, unfortunately, because uh, about two thirds of the way through the class, I don't know if any of you picked up the media on this, but there was an airplane that crashed. And apparently that's a once in a 20 year uh, event up there. But uh, some of the individuals that were in the class had to leave and tend to that, of course. And uh, thank goodness there were no fatalities, but there were some serious injuries. But uh, when we finish that class, I bring those numbers back and enter them in the federal database at the uh, Federal Highway Administration. And uh, that's all included in some of these statistics that you're going to see right now. So train the trainer sessions, we're still uh, in the country. They're still sitting at 466. You can see the people that are, um, you can see the people that have participated in that. Uh, it says 23% of participants have provided training. I know at some point in time here, we're going to show you a slide and it'll indicate the number of people that we have that are trained uh, to present the program in this state. And I'll reflect on that uh, when we get to that slide. Uh, In-person responder training, uh, you can see over 17,000 uh, sessions and a lot of people, almost 400,000 participants, but, but almost 400,000 participants is still a very low number uh, nationwide. So we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Web-based training, you can see that number. Um, that's a, in most cases, that is a federal highway administration uh, program. That's not a state-oriented program in most cases, not every case, but in most cases. And then you see the total number down, almost a half a million people trained. Still got a long ways to go. Next slide, Jeff. Okay, train the trainer session. You see South Carolina down in the uh, where South Carolina is. You can see the number 203. I mentioned that a little earlier. We have had several train the trainer classes a few years ago. And at this point in time, there are active right now, there are probably five to six people that are doing this program out of that 203. So we're not really in a rush to have more train the trainer programs right now. Uh, after looking at that and reflecting on the number that we've already done and the expense that was put into training all these people and the, uh, the, the results that have come back from it. And you combine that with the fact that if you need some training, all you have to do is get a hold of myself or Ray Parker at SCDOT and we will schedule whatever we need, you know, with a couple little parameters and we'll talk about those in a couple more slides. But uh, that's basically what we're looking at there. Next slide, Jeff. <clears throat> okay, so training program, what do we got? In-person and web, again, as of September the 8th in South Carolina, almost 7,300 in-person, almost 1,000 um, uh, over, uh, over the online program. So we're, we're getting there again. We've still got a long ways to go. Next slide, Jeff. And that's the total of the both, uh, of both uh, the numbers combined, 8,430. Um, go ahead, Jeff. <clears throat> so, our goal when I got uh, involved in this originally was 45%. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. We hit that pretty easily. Last year, 2019, I wanted to get over 50%. We hit uh, about 50.6 or so, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, we, we achieved our goal. This year, I set the goal at 60%. <clears throat> now you can say, well, that's great, 60%, whether you're a half a glass half full or half empty person, that still means that 40% of our uh, responders that are out there exposed to those D drivers uh, have as of yet to receive the training. So we've got, again, we've got a lot of work to do. We are sitting, even with the uh, COVID restrictions, which are starting to back off a little bit now, and that's good, but we're sitting right now at 58.8%. Uh, that's uh, reflected as of September the 8th. So there's been a couple of classes since then. Uh, so that number hopefully will be up over 59% uh, when they issue the, again, once a month they issue these updates. So we'll be over 59% closing in on 60. And I fully expect that we will hit 60% in South Carolina uh, before the end of the year. So I'm looking forward to seeing that number bumped up at least 1.2% more, and I, I'm, I feel pretty confident that it will be. You can see some of the other states how well or how uh, not so well they're doing, like uh, up in Idaho over on the left, they're 10.3%. Um, that's a shame because uh, they, they certainly need the, the, that program, all first responders do. Um, 
So a lot of work to be done all over the country, but of course our focus is right here in this state. We want to make sure that, again, as I mentioned earlier, everybody's playing off the same sheet of music and we're all having a, um, a, a safe experience out in the roadways. Go ahead, Jeff. <clears throat> so here are some of the numbers. Um, I think at some point in time, these are going to have to be adjusted and they're not really as high uh, as they're indicating here. Uh, for example, law enforcement up top, it shows 258,806 law enforcement officers in the country. In reality, there are eight, 815,000 law enforcement officers. So when you look at that 127,560, that percentage will be much, much lower when you take out 258,806 and replace that with 815,000. That number is going to be a lot lower. I expect that uh, these percentages will drop with fire rescue, EMS, and all those other categories as well. I don't think the feds, uh, I don't think those numbers are entirely accurate. So those percentages are going to drop, which, I mean, what does that mean? We got a lot of work to do. Go ahead, Jeff. So let's look at uh, local here. Horry County, uh, as of, and these, uh, these are not uh, today. These are the last figures that I, that I uh, uh, got a county fatality numbers. Uh, we get uh, regular updates. Uh, Ray Parker works uh, tirelessly on a lot, of the, a lot of things, but one of the things that he, uh, he, he uh, uh, shares with us are the uh, local fatality statistics. Uh, and uh, we get daily numbers. I'm just looking at a number that uh, I got this morning through uh, 922. Uh, th those numbers are not reflected in this. This was the last uh, a county total uh, sheet that we got. So you can see uh, Horry County local, Horry County's uh, 36 fatalities as of the 7th of this month, Williamsburg County 11. You can read the numbers, Georgetown, Marion, the deadliest counties, and uh, there's no no uh, joy in being number one, but Greenville is number one at 50, and then it goes down the list, Spartanburg, Horry County, Charleston, and uh, Berkeley County. You can see the numbers there. Uh, next slide, Jeff. So year to date is, no, is not 706. Year to date right now, uh, as of this morning, is 707. So it's up one. And uh, but in relation to that 706, you can see the percentages there with Horry, Williamsburg, Georgetown, and Marion counties. So about 8%, almost 9% of the fatalities in our state uh, year to date are in uh, those, uh, those four counties. So uh, that's something that uh, all of us are working on to, to try and uh, you know, get those numbers down. So that's important. Next slide, sir. So, we have a great presentation here uh, with Kevin Smith, field project manager with Parsons, and uh, it's it, all about distracted driving. And Kevin, I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay. Uh, I appreciate being here. Uh, I'm a 29 year retired law enforcement. I got out as a lieutenant uh, from a metropolitan police department just north of the city of Atlanta. Uh, I spent the last 10 years or so. Uh, really actively involved in traffic incident management and most of my career was in traffic and motors and working fatality crashes and that type of thing. Um, the topic today, okay Jeff, if you'll advance the slide please, is distracted driving. This is something we see every day. We see people on the phone, putting on makeup, shaving, taking notes, talking on their texting, talking on their phone, or eating every day in cars. Um, obviously, some of these are easy distracted driving cases for law enforcement to make. But at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're looking at distracted driving as a whole. And this particular presentation isn't necessarily focused on the citizen distracted driving. If you'll advance the slide, please. It's focused on first responder distracted driving. Is this a common occurrence in your patrol vehicle or in your emergency response vehicle? Uh, fire service, since they, they work in teams typically and now the right seater will control the laptop, it, it doesn't happen nearly as often and your driver is able to focus totally on the road. But uh, when law enforcement typically riding one in a car, 
we're looking at our laptop, we're picking up messages on the way to the call and so forth. Anything that happens that takes your attention away from driving that car is distracted driving. Next slide, please. Yeah, public safety, we may be uh, illegally exempt from the distracted driving laws, but we are not immune from the reason that we have the laws. We're not immune from being distracted behind the wheel ourselves. Currently, it's estimated uh, between 30 and 35% of public safety crashes involve distracted driving on the public safety employee. The primary offenders are the laptop and the, and the cell phone. But uh, currently, the, the lap, for at least for law enforcement, the laptop is the primary method of information delivery. Any law enforcement officers out there know that uh, when you go to a call, you, know, you, get, you get the call through your, your laptop or whatnot. Um, Many times, uh, there you may be say there's a lookout on a subject leaving a house on a domestic dispute. You may ask dispatch, "Give me that lookout again." Sometimes the response is, "It's in your, it's in the call." Well, that's all well and good if you're sitting on the side of the road, but driving down the road is not the time when you need to be trying to look as you're driving down at that laptop and trying to pick out the description of the person you're looking for. This is where it's really important that even though it's old school and it's going to take up some airtime, that the dispatcher repeat that description to you while you're driving. Not only is it good for you as the primary unit responding to that call so you don't have to look at the laptop, but there may be other, um, other officers or other supervisors that don't have a laptop in front of them that can also hear the lookout and hear what's going on. So keeping up that communication, obviously we wanna keep the dispatch channel free as much as possible, but at the same time, there are some times when you need that information over the radio. Next slide. Um, agencies, you know, the, the big thing that uh, we're looking at here is that studies have shown that audio stimuli in the human brain takes precedence over visual stimuli. And when we attempt to multitask or try to focus on more than one thing at a time, our visual range will decrease if an audio stimuli is involved. That's what this graphic shows. You can see in the windshield that a, a driver paying attention to just the road can see most of his windshield. But when you start talking on the phone, when you start texting, when you start looking at something other than what's on the roadway, even if it's just talking. Your visual acuity or the amount that your brain actually takes in and registers reduces significantly. It reduces by as much as 50 or 60%. This may go back to prehistoric days when it was more important to hear that saber-toothed tiger out in the, in the wild and jungle than see it. By the time you see it, it's too late. So uh, you can see that drivers using a cell phone and see significantly less of what they're what the traffic is doing around them. Um, well, they say, well, we have a hands-free law, so I'm not having to deal with the, the phone. And I don't know if um, South Carolina does. I know you have a, a texting law. But many years ago, it's probably as many as 10 or 15 years ago, studies, statistical studies show, uh, show that there is no real statistical difference in the amount of distraction between a hands-free and a handheld device. The statistical difference is so small that 10, 12, 13 years ago, the studies through uh, National Institute of Health and the other agencies stopped differentiating between handheld and hands-free. Both of them are just as bad as the other when it comes to distracted driving. Okay, if you'll advance slide, please. This next little video here is of a bicyclist and we'll kind of skip over the fact that he went past the stop bar here, but you can see he's looking, he's got a helmet cam mounted on his helmet and he's looking and you can see to the right, you're going to see a squad car coming down through there. And he looks back and... You mother! Why the fuck are you looking at your phone, officer? The officer was looking at his, well, uh, the, the guy on the bike says that he was looking at his phone. It's obvious that the guy was sitting there. 
a bicyclist was sitting there, an undistracted driver, police off not, because we're no different than the average citizen when it comes to driving. We just have, I think, more distractions in our patrol vehicles than they do. Um, he didn't see the bicyclist sitting there waiting to make his left turn. This is some of the some of the issues that we run into when we're trying to pay attention to laptops and cell phones and take calls from supervisors or personal phone calls while we're working. Next slide. Police constantly warn us about the dangers of distracting, distracting, distracted driving. They can even give you a ticket if you're texting behind the wheel. But a 41 Action News investigation found some officers are not taking their own advice. Investigator Ryan Katz shows the consequences of what happens when an officer's attention wanders from the road. This photo was taken the day sisters Jessica and Kelly Ewell lost their lives. You'd ever know in life that that's your that that would be your last moment. And um, I really hope that they didn't know. It was the day after Thanksgiving in 2007. Kim Schlau remembers seeing the coroner walk up to her house. I didn't want to open the door because if I opened that door, it became real. You know, and until I opened that door, I still had three daughters. Jessica and Kelly died in a horrific head-on collision with an Illinois state trooper. He literally drove through the top of their car. The trooper was responding to a car crash in the St. Louis area. Court records show he was driving 126 miles per hour, talking to his girlfriend on a cell phone, and emailing for directions on his computer when he lost control of the car. On so many levels, this crash was preventable. An extreme and tragic example. <laughs> We found video of other crashes that never made headlines. Watch as this Missouri State Trooper driving 60 while looking at his computer drifts off the road and then loses control. 41 Action News investigators look through 40 crash reports in Missouri, all with a common cause, distracted driving by law enforcement. I said, watch out. And that's when he hit. Bob Dyer was driving on this Independence Road last August when he slowed down to take a right-hand turn. The police officer driving behind him never even hit the brakes. Bob's head smashed the back window of his truck. He says, I'm so sorry. He says, I was looking at my computer. We read similar stories all over the state. Officers getting into wrecks because of distraction. And just listen to the close call a sheriff's deputy had last year. He was on the phone and approaching a railroad crossing in rural Johnson County, Missouri. He says he didn't see or hear the train coming until the very last second when he slammed on the brakes. The train collided with the bumper on the deputy's car and actually spun it around so it was parallel with the train tracks. That deputy just a couple feet away from losing his life. We found distraction is cited as the main cause in an average of three police crashes every month. Yeah, it's very easy to get distracted. Sergeant Andy Coates, a state patrol veteran of 17 years, admits there's a lot competing for his attention these days. On a black Ford Taurus. Along with the radio, there are lights and sirens, radar technology, and most of all, the laptop sitting right next to the wheel. Officers are wrecking squad cars all over the country because they're distracted, because they're looking, they're focused on something else. It's such a problem that Keith Wenzel, a longtime sergeant with the Dallas Police Department, now leads a crash course in distracted driving, from fender benders to serious wrecks. His message to officers, you can't divide your focus between computers and the road. You may get complacent in what you do and realize, well, I could do all these things and still maintain control of my vehicle when the reality is that you can't. Kel so as we can see, the objective from Arlington police should as you can see from that, uh, there's we are no different as public safety employees than the average citizen. Well, I mean we we serve the citizenry, but we come from the citizenry. We're, we don't all of a sudden become better drivers just because we wear a uniform or we, we drive an emergency vehicle. Uh, these next few, uh, these this next couple of minutes of video is just showing another another few examples of distracted driving by public safety. Okay, Jeff. Okay. 
Videos we obtained from Arlington police show other officers using their computers while slamming into drivers at intersections. This one rear ends the car in front of him. Another officer makes a left turn in front of an SUV, causing a violent collision. The driver of the SUV had minor injuries. There were two children in the car, but they were not hurt. One Arlington accident report we obtained shows an officer driving 50 miles per hour, flew off a roadway and into a light pole while typing on a computer. And this video shows an Arlington officer driving 40 miles an hour, using her computer and driving through a giant barricade on a dead end street. How distracted do you have to be to drive right through a barricade? You got to be pretty distracted to drive through a barricade. And this next little short video shows you what happens when the driver is looking at his laptop. Hey, Jeff. Not good. None of it's none of it's very good, but at the same time, they're all preventable because we just need to pay attention to the road. Some of the things that we can do, some of the strategies to help prevent a public safety crash is use the radio. It may be old school and it may tie up the dispatch channel a little bit, but it's more if, if you need the information right then, use the radio. If not, pull off to the side of the road if you must use the laptop or pull off to the shoulder at least. Um, you know, there are many times where I've been driving down, that I was driving down the road and the call came out and in my patrol car, I didn't have a, um, as a supervisor, I didn't have a, a weapon rack for my long guns in the, in the cab with me in the cockpit. I had a, uh, a vault in the back. So there are many times I would pull over on the side of the road on an armed robbery in progress call or this type of thing and get my long gun out and bring it up front with me so that I was prepared when I arrived. It's better to be a few seconds later and get there and get there prepared than it is uh, to have a, a crash or something on the way. You know, close that laptop lid to make it less appealing. It sits right there. We can check email. We can send messages. We can do all this. But when we're driving, we need to be paying attention to what we're doing. And there's technology out there that'll help us with that. There's technology out there where the um, computer can talk to you and give you directions as you're en route to your call. There's uh, technology out there that will lock the laptop screen or lock the keys while the vehicle's in motion so you can't type or you can't do any of that kind of stuff. You can still see your screen to get the information, but you can't update your screen while you're moving. Next slide. Also, uh, it's normally in April, but uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Safety Council postponed the observance of Distracted Driving Awareness Month from April to October of this year. So at the website right there, uh, nsc.org, nationalsafetycouncil.org, you can go to that website or you can go to the entire link right there. And uh, I'm sure through uh, Jeff Allen or Jeff Corbin, if you need that link and don't have it, we can get it to you. But that will take you to the Distracted Driving Awareness Month information through the National Safety Council. There are um, pamphlets you can download, information you can download and so forth, and suggestions on how to do public outreach and um, public safety announcements and that type of thing for distracted driving. Next slide. So just get ready for that, uh, you know, together. We can make this make our roads safer. I know every one of us out there, the last thing we want to do when we go to work that day is to cause injury or cause a crash or make things worse for people in our jurisdiction or the people that we serve. We're there to protect and serve, and we're there to try to make their lives better, not worse. And that's all I have. Anybody have any questions or comments? Please post them into the uh, into the chat here with uh, choosing all participants. We'll get those answered for you. If not, uh, again, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm with Parsons Corporation. 
if you need any information from me, you can reach out to Jeff Allen or Jeff Corbin, and I will get you that information. If not, I've enjoyed being able to speak with you guys today, and hopefully uh, you were able to learn something from the presentation. Jeff? Oh, that's right. Um, Jay, are you there? Uh, okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, uh, hey, I'm going to hand it off to you uh, from DHEC. He's got his presentation. I'll let him introduce himself. Go ahead, Jack. All right, just want to make sure that you can hear me. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, Jay, we can hear you. It's a little bit muffled, but we can hear you. All right. Um, any better? Can you get a little bit closer to your microphone, maybe? Um, how about now? Any better? Yeah, that's that's better. All right. We'll do this. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. So, yeah, I'm Jay Cox. I'm with the uh, PD Region Myrtle Beach uh, PHEC office. I'm the Environmental Response Coordinator. Our, Title recently changed from emergency response team to environmental response to kind of reflect more of what we're kind of focused with. Um, I'm going to the first slide. And one more. Okay. So, uh, usually if we get a call in, um, it's we we usually talking about some kind of wrecks or spill or or truck overturned. Um, you'll see there where it says Division of Emergency Response that that has changed to Environmental Response. There's a 24 hour number that is statewide that's listed there. And so we get calls that come in and and an 18 liter is turned over a truck a tractor trailer uh, could be a spill accident at a facility. And um, usually one of us in our office, there's five of us in the Horry County office, and we, we usually work a, a week at a time, and uh, we're, we're on call 24 hours. So the next slide. So on scene coordinator. Uh, so once we get a call, uh, we're considered the on scene coordinator, and they we're, we're dispatched by the Department of Environmental Response and we're typically there to to make an initial assessment of what's occurred uh, and some information gather some information and we are asked many times to be there uh, to assist whether that's police fire rescue or any, any other agency that might be there if they have questions about what might have been spilled or any technical information about that that type of it uh, material that may have been spilled. Uh, next slide. So what we usually, our DHEC responsibilities on route to the scene. So we're trying to establish contact with somebody that's on the scene that may be an incident, incident commander, such as a fire chief, or it may be a state trooper, uh, or, or any kind of, you know, first responder. Typically, uh, we'll, we'll try to contact that person that's on scene. Uh, we'll be looking at, you know, like where do we need to park, where are you at, uh, given an ETA of how long it'll take us to kind of get to the scene, and any questions that that first responder may have of us, you know, if they can do certain things while we're on en route to the, to the incident. Um, and we're also trying to see if we can start to get some information on the responsible party uh, to see if they have any contractors that are on, that they have that can come in and do some cleanup, um, get some contact information for things of that nature so that we can begin to uh, figure out what, what's going to be done for the cleanup, how much is going to be done, and, and how intensive that cleanup is going to be. Next slide. So the DHEC responsibilities, responsibilities on scene. So we are there to basically kind of address the release itself. Um, and so we're looking at what it was released from, 
what it's going to take to contain it and what it'll take to possibly clean it up in a in an appropriate manner. Next slide. And of course, more information. And this is information that may be coming in in, in different um, orders and what we have it here, but so we're looking at when it occurred. That will help us determine how much has maybe been released, what's been released, again, how much has been released. Do we kind of know what hazards are associated with it, you know, at that moment in time? Is it diesel? Is it gasoline? Is it hydraulic fluid? Um, do we have safety data sheets available for it? Are there any manifest papers that were available in the truck if we have those access to those? Do we have a responsible party on site? Sometimes we have an accident and the driver of the truck is on the way to the hospital. Um, so in that regards, we're trying to make contact with possibly that trucking company. Um, and again, do we know if there's a contractor that's already en route to the scene? Sometimes they, they do that pretty quickly. Sometimes it's not. Next, next slide. So again, to go along with the previous slide, identify extent, volume, impacted areas, areas with potential to be impacted, and other areas of concern. So that what that is relating to is, are there any surface waters that's going to be uh, impacted by the spill? Is it on concrete, asphalt, dirt, side of a road, on a farm, uh, in a business area, residential? And those situations will determine sometimes our response, whether it's, uh, you know, needs to be more immediate or a bigger response to it, or if it can be somewhat more uh, localized and be handled with some smaller contractors or tow companies. If we have an RP responsible party on site, we go ahead, uh, get all the information we can from them, their name, phone number, contacts, address, and then relay details of incident impact and their response. So we're talking to that RP saying, you know, that your trucking company that caused this and the spill, you know, occurred from your truck. So we're, you know, that responsibility for cleanup is going to pretty much be, you know, on on you to get the cleanup completed and uh, taken care of. Next slide. So if the responsible party is offside or we don't have one or we don't know one, so that's where we get into uh, sometimes assistance from your state trooper or county police, somebody that's on scene, your, your incident commander, fire chief, to help us sometimes to find out who that RP is. Um, like I said, sometimes they, they drive where the truck's already on their way to the hospital, and sometimes that state trooper that's on scene's already got all the information, and we'll start to make calls. Um, you know, from that information that we gain, gain from that incident commander, whoever's on scene. Uh, we also use other stuff, apps on our phone, to where we can use it, use the uh, DOT IDs on the truck, license plates. Uh, you'll see the CODO can assist with very short. That is our central office duty officer. And they have uh, access to a lot of resources that we can contact them and say, you know, we, this is the information we've got. Can you track something down that uh, will give us a responsible party? Next slide. We have responsibilities for cleanup. So uh, we're there basically to ensure that the environmental releases are properly disposed of. Uh, verify, you know, shipping or manifest for that waste material. Um, identify any receptors, so that gets back to did it impact any waterways or rivers or ditches or storm drains, and that helps us determine what kind of cleanup we're going to be looking for. We, we're not going to tell maybe exactly what needs to be, but we're going to say, you know, the responsibility lays on the RP. To ensure that a proper cleanup and proper disposal of the material has been completed. Next slide. What DEC is not responsible for. So we don't initiate evacuation. We don't do the traffic control. Uh, we aren't EMTs. Uh, we don't do public safety. 
and we don't do the roadside cleanup. Um, so that RP is responsible for that. They're the ones that have to hire a contractor or have somebody you know already on hand that that they can send to get that cleanup done. And sometimes, like I said, our roadside cleanup with state or county DOT. Sometimes the county does have a pretty good uh, crew already there, and they may put out some sand or some baby dry or or have a front loader or something like that that can scrape up something pretty quick. Um, but we're basically there to make sure that responsible party is the one that is that is getting the cleanup done. We will, you know, that that's a part of us contacting that incident incident commander that's on scene to tell us where do we need to park, where do you want me to go? You know, I'm driving this vehicle, um, so I can make it around a barricade if I need to. Um, and so we're going to want to make sure that we do what we're being told by the law enforcement and incident commanders on that's on scene. Uh, we don't want to step on anybody's toes with that. And uh, so we're there to try to help as much as we can. And each incident is going to be slightly different. There are no two that are like. Next slide. And this is going to be just some examples of some releases that we have dealt with in the past just to give an idea of what they may look like uh, either on the side of the road or how would a first responder drives up on them. Yep. And next slide. Oh, there's just, okay. Then we got fuel releases. That's the one that we probably typically see the most. Next slide. And you can see where we're looking at the situation or the fuel is going down a, a drainage way in the highway and it's not impacting a whole lot of soil grass it may not Im be impacting any storm drains it may not be going to any kind of waterways of any kind so the response to that may may vary uh and differ you know depending on the situation and where it's leaking and where it's going to next slide That is what we probably see the most of, a saddle tank that's been ruptured on the side of the road, spilling on asphalt and soil. Next slide. And again, more of the same. Um, we're going to be looking at, you know, what, how much soil may need to be removed. Um, are there going to be any impacts to the highway? Are we having rainy conditions where the fuel may cause, you know, some, some safety issues with driving and so we're, we're looking at all that next slide response actions <clears throat> so yeah what do we do this gets into some of the what the contractor that is hopefully on on call for the rp and uh, it can vary again uh, from sand dirt oil dry and again, it's going to be based on that situation. No, no two are going to be exactly alike. No region is, is going to be exactly alike. Depending on your county resources, um, some are somewhat more uh, willing to put out some stuff than some others. And you know, it just depends on the capabilities that are, that are available in that local area. Next. Uh, removal of roadside fuel contamination. That's going to come down to how much, what kind, you know, what type of fuel it may be, how much it may evaporate, the weather, is it sunny, is it rainy. Um, soil that's on the side of the road, we can't, it can be removed and placed in drums. And sometimes there is a vac truck that can be used. Again, it, it comes down to the amount that may have been released. Next slide. Uh, issues related to cleanup. This is where it can vary, Th things can vary, you know, county to county and, and various regions of the state. So uh, is the local DOT going to put down sand? Usually if they do, they probably won't pick it back up. So we'll have, you know, typically a contractor that may be on call with the RP to, to do that cleanup. Um, or they may, you know, contractor may be involved with it as well. And sometimes if you was on the pavement, you can't recover all of it, and uh, so you have kind of have to let it be attenuated naturally in the environment. And it'll, if you got a really nice sunny day, it'll, if it's gasoline, it may evaporate fairly quickly. Next slide. 
RP responsibilities. These are some of the things that we're going to be ensuring that the RP is doing, making any of the correct notifications uh, or any state or federal regulations. So uh, whether it's possibly a water release Coast Guard, again, the county, uh, any kind of state requirements that they need to contact uh, about the spill. Also going to look at the spill containment. So what kind of measures are they going to be using to contain a release? And are they going to be effective? Um, <clears throat> cleanup and removal of waste. Again, that's going to be usually your contractor that is hired by the uh, whoever was responsible for the spill. The disposal is going to be where we're going to ensure that they've taken it to a correct disposal facility, whether that's a landfill or a hazardous waste type disposal facility. And we're going to ensure that they have the proper uh, information that, that shows that they did take it there. And, um, and typically, whoever responds to that in DHEC will be the person that they send that back to to, to ensure we have a copy of it. Next slide. So that's about it pretty quick. Um, this is the first time we've done the virtual and we came up with this kind of presentation from a combination of some of our other slide presentation, our PowerPoint presentations. Um, the information on there, the, the red number, the 1-800-481-0125, that is a statewide number. So uh, if you do have something that you need to report or you have a, a fill, uh, you can use that number to report that. If you have questions locally, uh, our Myrtle Beach office number is there. And we also had the main, you know, Columbia line, 803-898-3432. Um, but if you do have questions about something, again, each release, each bill, each accident is going to be different. They're, they're never, any of them are exactly alike. Um, and we hope that, you know, we can, we can move back to a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting at some point. And um, appreciate the time to give this information to you. Thank you. Super stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> I can relate to both those presentations. Kevin, as you went through yours, I'm thinking of my assistant chief back in the in the fire department uh, approaching an intersection on a red light, did not change his siren pitch. He was on the radio, just, just about got T-boned. And uh, his uh, fix for that was uh, not changing his behavior, but installing another 47 lights on the front of his vehicle so people can better. Um, so thank you. That's old school of thought. Um, DHEC, I mean, uh, Jay, that was fabulous. That information we really need. We need to continue passing that information along. I know my 25, almost 25 years in the fire service and 15 years as a law enforcement officer, I've worked my share of, of uh, uh, hazmat incidents. And I'll tell you, that's the one thing about these Tim team meetings. This is where we get to know each other. We need to get to know each other before we are out on that nasty hazmat incident because it really helps, and I speak from experience, when we walk up and we know each other and we've already discussed a plan of attack and we, we all get a good feeling for what needs to be done. So these, please uh, share the word. These Tim team meetings are extremely important for us to network and get to know each other. So this is the first virtual Tim meeting in South Carolina. We're gonna hopefully put a schedule together for 2021. We're looking for suggestions, uh, locations to hold meetings, whether they're virtual meetings or face-to-face. -face. Uh, we are having a lot of Sharp 2 training right now, and, and that is face-to-face. -face. We are going with social distancing guidelines uh, taking temperatures, uh, uh, facial coverings, masks, that type of thing. Um, and we're, uh, you know, that's going along pretty well. But uh, we're, we're still planning on having these uh, Tim team meetings in the spring, uh, March and April, and of course, meetings in the fall as well. And if your agency can host a meeting, if you want to have a face to face and you've got a facility that we can come in and have these uh, do these presentations and get together and network, please let us know. Uh, we got another slide yet, Jeff? Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, training's picking up again, <clears throat> and uh, we're flexible. Uh, whenever you need 
uh, some training. If you have some people that you've added to your agency that need this training, uh, if you'd like to host a training session, just get a hold of myself or Ray Parker. We're, we're glad to put this thing together. The only two requirements we have, which are usually very easy to accommodate, uh, minimum 15 participants and open to all, and we will help you with this, open to all disciplines. Very, very important that we do that because everybody needs to be uh, trained here. Everybody needs to be playing off the same sheet of music. Jeff? Please follow us on Facebook, on Twitter. I mean, the key there is sctimnetwork.com as well. That's our website. If uh, you want to know anything about upcoming meetings and or Sharp 2 training, sctimnetwork.com, as you can see on the lower right-hand side, that's where you go to get any of that information or uh, you have someone wants to register for a class. We are constantly adding uh, training sessions I've got a lot of requests in the hopper right now, uh, just a matter of setting up and scheduling dates and then getting them on the, uh, the website. Anything else, Jeff? There's your contact information, Ray Parker, who is uh, also participating in this meeting. We wanna thank Ray because uh, his support and, and everything he does for this program, along with the 4,683 other things that he gets to do at SCDOT. I mean, we really appreciate uh, everything he does for this program. Uh, so you've got his uh, email, his phone number, you have my email, my phone number, uh, anything else you need, you wanna schedule a class or you have some other questions, don't hesitate to get, long, uh, to, uh, to get in touch with us. Uh, Jeff Corbin, you wanna wrap this up? Just want to thank everybody for participating today. As Jeff mentioned, this is our first virtual Tim team meeting. Hopefully we'll be scheduling some more events soon and be sharing that information through our social media channels as well as our website. Uh, meeting uh, information from today, including the PowerPoint and links and other contact details will be shared um, via the uh, SC Tim Network website as well. Jeff, unless you've got something else, I think we are at an end. That's it. And we're uh, right inside that one hour. It's absolutely perfect. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it very much. And be safe, please.